Thank you, brethren, for having a love for the truth, inclining yourself to hear these things being preached, expecting to be benefited, no doubt. <clears throat> now, it is true, on that wonderful night out there on the Judean countryside, the angelic host appeared out of the unseen realm and and praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace and goodwill to men. Now that's a positive affirmation of what God was going to do in Christ Jesus, and the gospel message is indeed positive affirmations of what God said he was going to do. The gospel is all about this. However, instead of telling you what the gospel is, I'm going to spend some time in telling you what the gospel is not. You see, now the Apostle Paul, he was in a situation where he had to tell some brethren, he had to tell them, the gospel that I preach is not after man, you see. And this is the most, most important point Paul seeks to establish, and it's the most fu fundamental consideration in salvation to know. Now what we've been given comes from God. You see, it comes from God, and it's not of man. And you will note that Paul has already addressed this in the first verse. And he already touched on this when he said, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither um, by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So from the very first verse, you know, this is on the apostle's mind. I got a message, and these Galatians need to know it doesn't come from man. It comes from God. God is going, Paul is going to establish, first of all, nothing I have comes from men, by the way. Now, you've got to know, brethren, that the truth of this one phrase is not of man. It sets our message apart from any other message you will hear out there in the world. And I'm, I'm, for one, I'm praising God that the gospel we preach by George is not of man, neither by man. Huh? <clears throat> for all we've been given has come from heaven. The message we preach comes from there. The spirit we receive comes from heaven, comes from there. The message we preach and, and all of the things come from him. The Lord, the Lord of glory who brings the message, he comes from there. And the, and the spirit of God comes from there. So they all have the origins from the Father who is in heaven, you see. <laughs> you see the commonality in all these things, I'm sure. Everything we get that, we, that comes to us in the kingdom of God, everything that, that comes, that comes, comes to us in the initially and all those things that come designed to keep us in, they must come from heaven. And as you know, it was not given. <clears throat> Our gospel was not given or it was not, trans let me say it this way, it was not transmitted to men to begin with through some kind of dream, trance, or vision. <clears throat> but our message, brethren, was hand carried by Jesus Christ himself. The very Son of God brought this message from heaven. And I want you to know the same one who brought the message, why he, he turns out to be the Savior of the message, the gospel message I'm talking about. So then our gospel message was verified by a Savior. It was made authentic and genuine by him, by his life and his death and his resurrection. He, he stamped it, this gospel message, as being valid and authentic. Listen to the apostle, you see. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved to God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you all, as you also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, he hath taken, and by wicked hands hath crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. That he's talking about death. So you see, brethren, let the world take notice today. Our gospel's not after man. For our gospel features our gospel features a savior who gives his life. Amen. Now, even though the gospel message, the good news of the gospel message comes by way of the man Christ Jesus, <laughs> our gospel's still not in any way after man. Not the kind of man that we are, I'm talking about. <clears throat> it has our message has nothing to do with Adam whatsoever. Adam's race, since no man of Adam has been to heaven to return and tell about anything there. We had to be told about heavenly things by the one who comes from heaven. Jesus said, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down 
from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Remember that Jesus told the religious leaders, remember this, if I tell you of earthly things and you do not believe, how in the world are you going to believe when I tell you of heavenly things? This is Jesus who comes from heaven. Jesus has come from that place far above us uh, to speak to all the world the realities of the world to come. You see, the passing away of this one and, and the ushering in of a new world. And brethren, we received this testimony. We received this witness. And we believed the, the testimony of the apostle Peter when he made that good confession. Peter testifies to us, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We receive it. Paul is saying in our text, and I'll have you to know, and we were to say it, I'll have you to know, brethren, that the gospel I'm preaching, preaching certainly didn't come from men. That, that's how he's saying it. Paul is showing us where to start, actually. He's telling us where to start when casting out opposition to the truth. He's telling us that you first have to identify the corrupting influence it comes from men. You have to identify that first of all, and then you have to get rid of it. You have to throw it out and get rid of it. You have to get rid of the corruption. <clears throat> if it's a teaching, if it's a teaching that's corrupt, you've got to get rid of it. Throw it out. If it's men who are corrupt, you've got to get them out too. And this is the apostle doing just that. Pulling down strongholds, brethren, and any high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. And he's bringing into, after you do that, then bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is Paul. Paul's telling, Paul right, he calls these things high things. That's right. He calls them high things that exalts itself against the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. Anything that it lifts itself up, Paul's word to us is to cast them down. Tear it down <clears throat> for all of those who have discarded any kind of denominational identity. Well, brother, that's what you've done. You see, you've thrown that high thing down. You see, that's what you're supposed to do. There's a that there, and the reason. Now I'm gonna tell you a little something here, and you know this. <laughs> I'm not telling you anything, but uh, but then again, I am, aren't I? But this a defiling corruption. And it's, a, it's an effect on the pure, thing, the pure things of God. Yeah. You see that we've got to guard ourselves against. Yeah. The, a, de, a defiling effect takes place on, from men on the pure things of God. And it's, 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 uh, it's that part of that inborn corruption that resides in all mankind. So we have, to, we have to be on guard against these kind of things. The possibilities of this corruption spilling over on the things of God, uh, they are all too likely... They're all too likely when men get involved, you see. We should be aware of the limits of our liberty in the assembly of the saints, even our ideas and our opinions and our interpretations and what we think. <clears throat> should be labeled as just that, you see. Should they, should they become a high thing? And uh, we, see in this, we see these kind of things throughout the scriptures. You know, uh, you look back in the early days when God was still forming the thinking of men and, and he's laying down this and laying down that and men didn't really understand what God was doing but see he was laying a foundation we'll go back to Exodus 20-25 uh, and you know men have given all kinds of explanations why, uh, 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 why God told the Israelites not to make altars out of hewn stone there's all kinds of explanations for this but the fact of the matter is men were not free to do whatever they wanted to to the altar or even, even at the altar <clears throat> and didn't expect God to receive it. Uh, man's involvement on the altar and at the altar was strictly managed uh, by God. God wanted man's involvement as little as possible. You see that all through the scriptures, don't you? And, and, and what we know of men, what we know of the flesh, and it's no wonder. We don't, we don't marvel at this. The record there in Gen Exodus, actually, actually God first stated, built an altar of earth. That's what he said. However, though, if you make an altar of stone for me, God said, you must not build it out of cut stone. Don't do that, he said, because if you strike it with your chisel, you will profane it. God's instructions were to add nothing to it or you'll pollute the altar. Now, we're talking about the altar sacrifice. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. It's not that hard for understand then when you, when you examine these kind of statements from God. It's not too hard for us to understand that uh, we're not allowed to add, 
you know, what we want to. <clears throat> and that, that men, really, we're, we're not able to contribute uh, anything to what God is doing uh, except for those things that he's allowed us to enter into. You know, Adam knew, he knew, Adam knew the seriousness of their situation when all of a sudden they realized they were naked and ashamed. And their efforts to recover themselves, to fix the problem, well, we know God just couldn't receive that. He didn't receive it. Putting our hands to the work of salvation is just about as flimsy as Adam and Eve trying to sew fig leaves together. I've noticed that any time men intrude into the gospel of God with their own ideas and thinking, inevitably they remove men out of the grace of God. They do it. And they end up in a, a work for salvation kind of thinking. And a, a, some kind of a works for righteousness based system. Every time men put their hands to something God has done. I don't know why it's so hard for men to understand. Why is it so hard for They just don't get it. That the work of man profanes all things. Actually, we just have to say it to the way it really is. Whenever men, even religious men, when they try to make themselves right before God, and it rises on, on their own, it just rises up as a stench before the nostrils of God. We got this in Scripture, brethren. God is not going to receive any of that. He just can't. You know, in the beginning, Solomon had so much reverence for God. You remember this, that he had all the stones cut and shaped in the quarry so that no sound of a man's tool would be heard at the temple site. Our own efforts to make ourselves right before God, you know, we can just throw all them tools down. Just throw them down. They're not allowed in the workplace of God's salvation. Not in, not in the work God is doing in Christ Jesus, they're not. Jesus cried from the cross, it is finished. He said this just before he dismissed his spirit, and he died, you see. And you know, in a sense, it's just, I thought to myself, you know, it's just blasphemous, isn't it? Uh, for men to feel like they need a do, to do, to come along and just fine tune the message a little bit. You know, that's blessed. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself indeed. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's commands. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. That's the word, brethren. These are the works given for us. There are works given for us to do, no doubt. There are God ordained works, they're called good works, too. And because they are sanctified and approved to God, and we're allowed to do them because we've been made righteous, we can enter into it. One more thing. I don't hear much anymore of the gospel being preached. All I hear anymore is church duty. What have you done? This is what I'm doing. This is what we are doing. This is what you need to be doing. Well, Jesus was one to speak concerning duty. He did. He spoke on this. Remember Luke 17? I talk about duty to God. And uh, he said in this verse I'm going to read, he said, So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded, you say, you say, <laughs> we are unprofitable servants. We have done only that which we should have done. You, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This was Jesus' bottom line answer to the disciples' response there in that chapter. Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> Jesus throws the door wide open to duty, and he makes it a, primarily a matter of faith, you see. Right. Right. Paul is verifying and confirming to them with authority, by the way, that the message they responded to, he's talking about the Gal Gal back in Galatia now, he's telling them the message you responded to was indeed the genuine true gospel message, yeah. which meant they had indeed been brought into the kingdom of God. Paul's telling you, you came in, brethren, <clears throat> Because he, did, because he said the gospel I received <laughs> did come from men. It didn't work. It didn't work. You, the, result, the, the results you realized from what you heard was because the message I preached was from God. What he said. Paul had to tell them this. He just had to come right out and say it. Because you remember the situation there. Corrupt teachers, leaders whatever you want to call them, had come in behind the apostle after he left and they had, had a, attempted to change and to alter the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know that this was Paul's greatest fear. This was his greatest fear. 
he told the Galatians later on, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. It's been all, these kind of men all along who look not after the things of God, but rather the things of man. He wanted to add something to what God has said or take something away. It's men taking away and adding to what God has said, either by commentary or translation or some other means. It's the things, like I said earlier, we've got to cast them down. Remember what Paul said to another assembly? For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom you, we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which we have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. The idea is here, okay, is he that cometh. He's talking about these corrupt teachers and preachers. If they are actually presenting a greater salvation than the one that we brought in Christ Jesus, if they are really presenting a greater Holy Spirit, a better gospel, then I wouldn't blame you, okay, for your behavior. But, it, but the fact is, they are not, Paul said. Paul reasons all through his letters that men cannot bring a better salvation than the one that God has brought in Christ Jesus. And we can say to accept a different gospel than the one we've received is to receive a lesser one, you see. And we know to take from what men offer, it's really, it's really to enter into a worse state. It's to enter into a worse state than we were before. I've done that. I was in a worse shape than I was to begin with because I took from the table of men. For Jesus Christ is a complete Savior, you see. And the Holy Spirit is the only sanctifying Spirit. And the gospel is a perfect word. It comes from God and it cannot be improved upon it doesn't need any tweaking from men is what I'm trying to say. They just need to keep their hands off of it. That's what I'm saying. We already know each time something has been added or taken away, well, don't it cease to become, doesn't it cease to be the word of God then, the, what, what, what was delivered to the saints? There is no other message than the one Jesus Christ brought. Now, you know, we've already, <laughs> we know these things. It's already been said today. It's the one that he gave to the apostles. And we continue to preach this message. It's really very simple, really. That's, and, and it is the power of God into salvation. And brethren, this is why Paul is so emphatic. He says, I don't care who it is, if it's an angel from heaven, if one comes and preaches something other than what we preach, let them be accursed. Paul said this. He also, uh, he also said men have come in and have perverted the gospel of Christ. And you can tell from the sound of it, Paul didn't like it one little bit. He said a bunch of perverts have come in here and they brought all kind of perversions to the, to the message that we brought you, Galatians 1, 7. Paul asked, am I trying to win the approval of men or God? Question. If I were trying to please men, I sure wouldn't be a servant of Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. <clears throat> in order to bring a contrary message into the assembly, First thing you've got to do, you've just got to discredit. In this, in this instance, you've got to discredit the Apostle Paul. That's the first thing you've got to do. You've got to like, you got to discredit him in the eyes of the brother. They said Paul, he didn't oh, he didn't hold to the apostolic tradition. That's what they said. He didn't act like the other apostles. Huh? He didn't preach and teach like they did. He focused on different things. He had different things to say, accusing Paul of teaching things and doing things that were contrary to what the other apostles were teaching and doing. <clears throat> this effort of the false brethren was to undercut the ministry of the apostle Paul there. Simple as that. It was Satan. It was his purpose to divide and then to conquer that assembly there. Separate brethren from one another and then to separate from the, from the Lord. Well, you understand don't you? Don't you understand this? The devil is trying his dead level best to pry you loose from Jesus Christ. That's what he He won't stop at anything to pry you loose. Those are the tactics of the evil one. Bring ideas and opinions into the assembly. Offend, offend some brethren. Huh? Maybe they'll leave. All right? Here's a tactic that we've seen. Men come in and they profess to love the Lord. They do. They come in, you think they love the Lord. The best we can tell, they love the brethren too. <laughs> they speak highly and honorably and respectfully of Jesus, but they don't have any good thing to say of Paul. <laughs> that don't sound right to me. What's going on there? 
<clears throat> this is something that was going on in, in the apostolic era. Apostle Peter. Somebody done read this. This is Apostle Peter picked up on this. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, had written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things which is hard to understand, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. It's the craziest thing, isn't it? <laughs> These men who accuse Paul of not having a legitimate message, they've not gone away. They're still here. Amen. After all this time, they're still here doing the same thing. It's like there's an evil spirit behind it or something. Religious groups, they construct a theology pr predominantly around what Jesus said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then they ignore the writings of Paul. It's the craziest thing. Even though it's in his writings, Paul's writings, we have practically all the exposition of what took place in salvation. Uh, it's Paul who dominates the conversation and discussion concerning the accomplishments of Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. It's Apostle Paul. Most of everything we know about the glory of God and the world to come is found in his writings. Ignoring Paul's writings of some other something another, do you reckon that's why the professed church doesn't know that we are complete in Christ Jesus and we need no other thing? Because you know this is what Paul said. We are complete in him. Picking and choosing through the scriptures. What's going on with that I ask you today? Now, can men, I'm going to ask, can men and groups like this be trusted? What they're really up to. Now, the salvation of God can consist entirely of this man Christ Jesus. We are brought into fellowship of God through him. Praise God. We are put into him and all those who are joined to the Lord are one spirit. God has not put us into a religion that is about Jesus Christ. <laughs> he has put the saints in Christ Jesus himself and this is the only way that we can have fellowship with God. I'm here to tell you because you know it's Jesus that's going to bring us to God personally escort us there for the father receives the son and knows all who and all those who are with them so salvation it boils down to really is about a person the man Christ Jesus people have to know am I connected to him or am I connected to something else you see even if it's religious in nature Paul said the gospel I received did not come from men Paul was set for the defense of the gospel and he was appointed by uh, he was appointed for this and equipped for this. He was quick to point out in the beginning, in the second chapter, I was not taught by men, not any man, not even the apostles. Just like all the other apostles, I received the gospel and my commission by revelation personally, just like they did. Paul would be the first to tell you what God has given man should not be meddling with then. God commanded salvation, and we receive it in the way of a promise. Paul continues to develop his reasoning, and he begins, he really begins to set his message apart from all the other messages right here in this letter. He just asked him flat out. <laughs> he just asked him, did you receive the Spirit through the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He just asked him that. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Praise God for the obedience of the faith. Amen. Having begun in the spirit, Paul is referring to, of course, that spirit that gives life. The spirit, the scriptures make it plain that we can't have spiritual life without the spirit of God. He is that spirit of life. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit, huh, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. The Spirit of life. This is, the, this is the distinction that Paul is beginning to make here. The difference of what God gives and the things that men bring in so many words Paul asks. Are you alive? Are you alive today? <clears throat> okay then. Now this Spirit of life that made you alive to the things of God giving you joy and peace and believing, giving you the testimony of a clean conscience, love for God and love for, for the brethren. How did you come about all these good things then? Huh? Was it due to your uh, 
Was it due to your compliance to religious uh, instructions or the doing of religious ceremonies, special obser ob observances? Is this what made you alive to God? Paul, you can hear Paul saying, oh, no. It wasn't. It was by the hearing of faith. You see how, how Paul is, he, now he's associating certain things here. Associating faith with receiving from God. <laughs> faith in the gospel message he preached. It's by the hearing of faith that we receive God, uh, we receive of God into the kingdom, into the kingdom. And it's by the hearing of the faith that we receive the Holy Spirit and all these, all these good things. By the hearing of the gospel mixed with faith, the scriptures say we're both received and we receive the abundance of God in Christ Jesus. God sends the Holy Spirit and we know this because the Spirit has come and to us, and dwells with us, and stays with us. He, he never leaves, brethren. He'll, he'll be with us as we leave this, this, leave this realm. Paul presents faith. Know this. It's our faith standing opposed to what we can do. you got faith on the other hand, and then you got what you can do, brethren. All our sacrifice and all our good works cannot atone for sin. And it's, this has already been declared. Let a man hear this from the Scripture. The soul that sinneth it shall die. Amen. And this is what the atonement is for, isn't it, brethren? It's for the soul that sinneth. That's what the atonement is for. The gospel Paul preached was not a man because what Paul preached brought to them life and life everlasting. Further down in verse 21 in this chapter, Paul will say, It is the law, it's the law then against the promises of God question. God forbid, for if there be, had been a given a law, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been done by the law. Paul continues. He, he, he's building a case here. He now connects life and righteousness with spiritual life produced, produced in us. The hearing of faith, the spirit that gives life. Now Paul is still comparing all these things together. At the scripture we just read, it, it declares that the law could not impart life, or it would have, or it would have done that. You see, the law was unable to. Now I want you to stay with me, brethren. Okay, <laughs> stay with me. It says that the law couldn't, or it would have, right? Amen. Huh? That's the thing. So, so what Paul is trying to get across to these brethren is, on their own efforts, why they 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 don't mess up. Is what he's telling them. You got life, you have the evidence of life. Don't get yourself in a big old mess, you see. And, it, and we are justified before God by faith. In other words, righteousness, you see, was imputed to us. All the blessings of God come by way, come by way of believing, believing what God has said in the gospel message concerning his son, Jesus Christ. Righteousness in life. Testimony to the effectiveness of the gospel. Hmm? We know this is true because transgression brought death, but the righteousness which is imputed to us brought life. Okay? Jesus' words, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. If everything you've done was not from out of faith in Christ Jesus, my brethren, it was just, it was just all in vain. That's all. That can be corrected, but it, you, know, you just have to say it. it. It won't get you anywhere with God. It won't count. You see, it just can't count. <clears throat> because in the end, you're going to have to be alive to God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> you're going to have to be alive to God in Christ Jesus in order just to make that transition from this world to the next world. Because you remember what the brethren told us earlier, God is going to come in flaming fire. Just the very presence of God when he breaks through into this realm, then everything that's of the natural order will just, just disappear. You've got to have some life already <laughs> to make that transition. <clears throat> now, 
This life comes by way of a message from God. It is a gospel we preach. It consists of all the things our Lord has said and all the things that were accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection and his continual intercession for us in glory and his eventual coming to gather into himself all those who belong to him. This is the gospel in a nutshell. Finally, this my brethren. <laughs> Where'd that come from? Finally, it's my thinking, brethren, my opinion, that God has allowed the devil to completely divide and fragment the, the efforts of religious men today for a purpose. You know, because you look out there, it's hard to imagine things could be more fragmented and divided than what we got today. And Paul said at Thessalonians, he tell uh, the church there in Thess Thessalonica that there's coming a great falling away. Okay, to the extent the falling away was become so great that even 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 the elect even the elect it would be it would be uh, of such a nature that even the elect could be led away by the by the deception that's coming. You see, so <clears throat> a word like today to realize that the message we should receive is not of man. It's something that we have to keep in the, in, the, in, the, in, our, in the background running all the time because we, we want to be on guard that we don't pick up something from men, that we, that we love the truth because in the end it's going to be a love for the truth, you see. And, the, and, and what I mean by that, a love for the gospel message that's been given, it's going to be a love for that that's going to save us and, and, and keep us to the end. Brother, I appreciate your attention. God bless you.